our lives at unexpected times. Bless us as we light this candle to keep vigil for your arrival. We trust that even though we do not know the day or the hour, you hurry to gather all people to your peace. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shall fall upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has fallen upon you. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> let us read Psalm 122 responsively after the Antiphon is sung. <laughs> Let us live honorably as in the day, 
not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. so too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. <clears throat> Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So the Advent season has begun. I'm sure most of us have already started preparing, or we will very shortly begin preparing. All of our shopping and decorating and wrapping and baking all await us in the coming weeks. We're busy getting ready. But are we get readying ourselves for the things that really matter? I always chuckle just a little bit, I don't know about you, at the contrast between the tone of the Christmas season and our first readings for the Advent season. The readings are apocalyptic and they speak of the second coming and the final judgment and the end of the world. You have that on the one hand, and then you have that contrasted with Santa and Frosty and Rudolph on the other hand. Something seems discordant there to me. But the common theme between the apocalyptic readings and the season of Advent is that they are both about watching and waiting for the next coming of Jesus into our lives, for the next arrival of the divine to break into our world. The Roman Catholic mystic St. Bernard of Clairvaux spoke of three arrivals of Jesus into our lives. The first coming was when he arrived on earth in his bodily form. The so-called second coming will be when he returns at the end of the age. But there's another one that comes in between. This current coming of Jesus is when he arrives in our hearts and minds every single day as we walk the path of discipleship in this life. Now, waiting for either of the latter two of those three things is hard. It requires focus and mindfulness because, I don't know about all of you, but speaking for myself, we are a people who are easily distracted. Our culture has gotten less and less patient in an era when you can go onto Amazon and with the push of a button, anything your heart's desire can be sent to your door in less than a day. You can even get constant updates as to how far from your door it is. <laughs> and so waiting well is an intentional practice that has probably fallen a little bit out of use in our culture. Waiting requires discipline when you do not know when the thing you're waiting for will arrive. We don't get any tracking updates for just how much longer we have to wait for Jesus to return. <laughs> Jesus tries to teach the crowds patience in our gospel reading today. The new year of the lectionary rolls over with a story that is already in progress. Jesus and the disciples have been at the temple for the last few days by this time. 
They've been going around seeing the sights, and Jesus has been teaching the crowds, and of course he has been locked in debate with the religious leaders. The last chapter before this was particularly contentious. This story picks up as Jesus and the disciples are going home from the temple for the day. And on their way out the door, the disciples are commenting on how beautiful is the building around them. Look at the grandeur of this place. They've never seen anything like the temple living in the small villages and towns of the Holy Land, the northern region of Galilee where they live. And Jesus says to them, do you see all these magnificent things? Not one of these stones will be left on another. There will be a day when they are all thrown down. And that leads us into this passage for today. Furthermore, we're also nearing the end of Jesus' life in this story, and so you could see him as leaving final instructions here on exactly how to watch and wait for his return. And as he does so, Jesus tells them that even he does not know the day and the hour that he will return. Now, for those of us that worship Jesus as God, this seems initially a little shocking to our sensibilities. If he's God, shouldn't he know everything? Well, the honest truth is, in a mystery that is beyond our full comprehension, when God came in human form, God emptied God's self of some of God's powers. We don't understand exactly what this means or how it happened, but we just know that it is. Jesus admitted there were things he did not know and things he could not do. And if Jesus himself did not know when the end was going to come, and he encouraged his disciples not to prognosticate when the end would come, how arrogant it is of some of us today to think that we can figure it out. Now, I don't want to have to talk about this, but unfortunately we must. A few years ago in our Western culture, we had the phenomenon of the Left Behind series. We had those books and those movies and how popular those became in our cultural zeitgeist. The Left Behind series speaks of the rapture, and it interprets the book of Revelation in an extremely literal way, and it scared a lot of people to death. It's worth pointing out that the mainstream church has never believed in that view of the end of the world. The mainstream church has always interpreted the book of Revelation much more symbolically than this literal point of view. So I have to take the time to point that out. But nevertheless, you have your doomsday preachers who look to worldly signs and think that they can crack the code. They think that they can figure out when Jesus is going to come again. And their desire to do that, at the end of the day, is very natural. Human nature wants to know. We don't like not knowing. We want those shipping updates as far as how much longer it's going to take for Jesus to return. But it doesn't change the fact that Jesus already told us, I don't know, you don't know, and you're not going to figure it out. And so when we don't know, it is natural to fear a little bit. We naturally tend to fear the unknown. There's a baseline level of anxiety there. But not knowing does not need to cause us fear if we are followers of Jesus, if we believe in the gospel message. For the people he was speaking to on this day, they didn't know how his story would end. But we are people of resurrection. We live in the era of the empty tomb. Knowing how his story ended, there is no reason for us to fear. So how do we remain faithful in our state of not knowing? As we live in this balance of having no idea when Jesus is going to return, but with the promise that he will at some point. For what it's worth, the early church longed for Jesus' return. They prayed for it to happen as soon as possible. They did not fear it. Because they knew that when he returns, it will bring about justice. It will invert the world's values just as God always does. And that there will be peace. That brings us to our beautiful Isaiah reading today about the nations turning their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's what the second coming of Jesus will bring. And what's more, these things can start in our lives in the here and now. Jesus repeatedly tells us over and over again that the reign of God is at hand. It is a present reality in our life right now. 
We can live in the way of this new reign of God, this new reign of peace right here. Jesus would have us know that God has not forgotten about us while we are waiting for him to return. However long that takes, that God is still active in our lives, that God is still near to us every day, and that we must take time to watch and look for the divine mystery and for God's promises to be fulfilled in our everyday life, in the lives of our loved ones, our neighbors, our community, and even in the midst of adversity. And very shortly after this passage, later on in Matthew, Jesus will give the crowds very concrete examples of the things that we can do to keep ourselves busy while we're waiting for him to return. We will feed the hungry, we will clothe the poor, we will visit the sick and the imprisoned, we will take care of the sheep while we're waiting for the shepherd to come back. This Advent season is all about waiting on the day of the Lord, hoping for the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has come, it is coming in our daily lives, and it will come again. And none of these things is anything to fear if we are claimed by the gospel, because the day of the Lord will bring about God's reign of peace and radical, boundless, unconditional love for all, a peace that has already begun to claim us in this life. And while we are waiting for that day, we train ourselves for the second coming by looking for the ways in which God is already present in our midst. So I challenge you to leave this place and think to yourself, where does God meet me in my life today, this week, this month? The divine mystery breaks into our real everyday lives on each day. We just have to be attentive and watch for the divine and not let it pass by us. Let us not spend so much time preparing for Christmas that we forget to prepare for Christ. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of the King, the one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, and according to the scriptures, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism and the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <coughs> As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for a new hope. God of all, your children everywhere cry out for mercy. Awaken the global church to the urgent needs of our time. Break down barriers of culture and custom and unite people of all faiths in your redemptive and healing work. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth's beauty and abundance is your gift. Teach us your ways of sharing resources and caring for life. Guard fragile habitats, preserve the wild places, and protect endangered plants and animals. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, you judge the nations. Beat our weapons into tools for serving our neighbors. May we heed the call of those who work for an end to war. We pray especially for lasting peace in the land of Jesus' birth. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of loving kindness, you desire fullness of life for everyone. Fill those who hunger, comfort the grieving, and attend to those near death. Bring help and hope to any who are sick or needing your care. We pray for those who have asked us to do so, remembering Ruth, Martha, Jan, Mary Rose, Charlotte, Brandon, Alice, Lorraine, Andrea, Judy, Debbie, Bill, Jim, Sally, Lavera, Tim, Eddie, Tamika, Michael, Lily, Carla, Tony, Lori, Mark, Donna, Jim, Pop, Tom, Joe, Norma, Patty, the Edwards and Diebold families, those who travel, those who serve in the military, in law enforcement, and as first responders, and all those who seek the comfort of God's love, who we name now either silently or out loud. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you are present when we gather in your name. Guide congregations in transition or conflict. Give wisdom to congregational councils, call committees, and ministry leaders. Keep us alert to unexpected opportunities for mission. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of promise, your goodness is everlasting. We give thanks for the lives of Eileen, Wilshon, and all of the faithful who now rest in you. We trust that you will bring us into the company of all saints with rejoicing. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, you'll notice 
announcements in your bulletin. Um, our angel tree here in the side narthex has, I think, four or five more tags on it. Glade Run tickets, those are the ones that are on the colored paper, um, which are um, for children served by Glade Run. Those presents are due back unwrapped next Sunday. The Hannes Wagner tags, which are for um, seniors at the Hannes Wagner apartment complex, those are due the following week, and those should be wrapped. So thanks to everyone who took a tag. There's still a couple more, so if you have space in your budget or heart, please grab one of those on your way out. Um, you may also have noticed we have new name tags. Um, some of them are on the back and some of them are in the front. Um, I did perhaps not a great job of guessing what door you enter. So if you didn't see yours, check the other side and you can either bring that with you as long as you remember to bring it back or leave it um, on the magnet board as you leave and put it on each morning or evening when you come to church. Um, there's a couple of um, Advent, Advent wreath prayers. Um, there's some printouts here in the side narthex. Anyone can make an Advent wreath. All you need are four candles. It doesn't actually have to be a wreath. Um, this is a lovely time of kind of settling into some home rituals, so I encourage you um, to do that. Next Sunday is our um, congregational meeting. We'll be electing our leadership for 2023, and we'll have the final ratification vote for our Constitution and Bylaws draft. Please come. Hopefully the meeting will be brief. Um, it's right after church next Sunday. Um, as a result, there's also no Saturday service next week either. Um, you may have noticed in the e-news, there's a survey about um, priorities for building work, um, what we'd like to see happen, what we need to take care of next. So um, if you'd like a print copy, just let me know. Otherwise, there's a, a link that you can click in the email newsletter. Um, we share communion as part of worship every week. We use real bread and real wine, but gluten-free wafers and grape juice are always available. Everyone who is baptized from any tradition is welcome to receive. If you'd prefer instead to receive a blessing, just cross your arms over your chest. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Father, for all in need, forgive me and justice. We ask this in Christ our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will make all things new in the day when he comes to reconcile the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
the body of Christ given for you. 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 Thank you. 